This is episode 59, friends of the Stand Up to Beat Dominic podcast. Joining me today are Dr. Aaron Carroll and Barry Ritholtz. We're going to talk about the consequences and the impacts of coronavirus on your health, on the country, and on commerce and the economy. Today's episode is brought to you by Patreon subscriber Dustin Barnett. His company is Triskeel. If you or your company or your team are looking to expand the reach of your brand, reach out to Triskeel Promo. Dustin's a longtime listener. This is his company. Really great guy who I've gotten to know pretty well. And basically, he'll put your logo on all kinds of brand name products for clothing like Patagonia or Lululemon. Also, your suitcases, your duffel bags, your backpacks, or even your technical equipment like your uh, your Google Home or your headphones like Beats or JBL speakers, Amazon, and everything in between. Go to triskeelpromo.com and you can reach out at info at triskeelpromo.com. That's T-R-I-S-K-E-L-E promo.com. You can find more information in the show notes. There's links. Dustin is the best. I hope you'll support him. He is bringing you today's show as well as all the other Patreons, patrons, if you will. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Let me know about your product, your company, or your cause, your book, anything you want to promote here on the show. I'll ping it for you. Also today, anybody who wants to go on a cruise with me, I will pay for it. How about that? The first five people who get back to me after hearing this, you are going to join me on a cruise. Who's with me? I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Nobody's going on a cruise right now, huh? I mean, you got to feel bad for the cruise lines. Whole bunch of other industries. We're all going to take a hit. There's what, what job, by the way, is not going... Who's going to make money? What, the mask makers? The, the healthcare industry? Who, who's going to be doing well during a viral pandemic spread. I think we're all going to take a hit, huh? Yeah, I'm joking about the cruise. Okay, joining me today, Dr. Aaron Carroll and Barry Ritholtz. Lots to talk about here on The Classroom of Life, where every single episode we talk about all kinds of issues that affect you, your family, the planet, your community. Obviously, coronavirus is taking over, well, literally, the planet. People are terrified. People are worried about their health. People are worried about their families. And of course, we're all worried about the economy and what this is going to mean for any of the plans that you have, whether it be a vacation or a gala that you are attending, a fundraiser. You've got some kind of a, an event that you're going to, a sporting event, a concert. Everything is getting interrupted. This is quite a lesson in our life and lots of questions as to how the Trump administration is handling it, what government could be doing better, where it started, how to stop it. Joining me today to talk about all of that, specifically in terms of health and the economy. First, Dr. Aaron Carroll and then Barry Ritholtz. Let's start with Dr. Aaron Carroll, who is a pediatrician and health researcher at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's the author of a whole bunch of books that debunk myths about your body and your health. Most recently, The Bad Food Bible. He has an award-winning YouTube page, Healthcare Triage. He's got a podcast. He's a contributor to the New York Times. One of the smartest health researchers in the country, a pediatrician, and a very good friend of mine on Twitter, where he's awesome, at Aaron E. Carroll. Here he is. Hi, Aaron. Hey, how are you? I'm so glad that you're back on the podcast. No, I'm so Thank glad you. to be back. Anytime. Very much for joining me uh, on the record. Obviously, we talk all the time off air, but I'm happy to have you here. There's a, a billion questions I have for you. So let me just jump right in, which is one of the most convincing things that you ever said, I feel like, on the show was in reference to conspiracies about there being a secret cure for cancer. You said, if that were true then you would have doctors that would use that cure. Yeah. You would know no doctor about it. It would, would die of cancer. Right. Right. For their own kids. For right. their own for themselves. Yeah. And so uh, the same uh, should be said about all of these uh, conspiracies about vaccines now as well, right? Pretty much every treatment. I mean if if there was a secret conspiracy and and somehow the healthcare system was involved, like no no one in the healthcare system would suffer. Like they would protect their themselves, their spouses, their kids, their friends. It's just it it wouldn't bad things wouldn't happen to physicians and of course bad things happen to physicians and their families every day. That being said, uh, a vaccine takes a long time to develop for a strain of virus like this and there's no guarantees, right? Yeah, I mean 
Yes, absolutely. So it's not a guarantee that you can come up with a vaccine for every virus. Uh, viruses can change. And also, it's, there's not a guarantee that it's going to work real well. Uh, the reason that the flu virus vaccine seems to change and how well it works every year is that influenza is incredibly good at changing its surface proteins. And so it masks itself year to year in different ways that, that evade immune systems and therefore evade the vaccines. Other viruses like you know, measles or polio or uh, diphtheria don't have that same ability. And so the vaccines work much better. And also you get them once and you pretty much have protection for a long period of time. We have no idea how it'll shape up with this, you know, type of coronavirus. We have no idea. I assume you're bringing this up all because of coronavirus, but we just don't know how it's going to go. So companies are certainly working like crazy to get a vaccine going um, if it's going to be needed, but but we just don't really know yet how long it'll take, how well it'll work, how well it'll be tolerated, how long it'll last. Well, yeah, that's the reason I'm asking. But more importantly, what I want to know is how are you, Dr. Aaron Carroll, handling this with your family? Because that's, I think, uh, what people want to know. You have so much of this information and knowledge, education, shared it uh, at the New York Times, at your... Yeah. YouTube show, Healthcare Triage, and of course on Twitter. How are you handling this outbreak in terms of the way that you and your family and your friends, the advice that you give and conduct yourself? The same way that we would handle, you know, flu season, to be honest. It's wash your hands a lot. Don't touch your face. Cough into your elbow. If you're sick, stay away from other people. And if other people are sick, stay away from them as much as you can. That, that those that's how you avoid viral infections in general. It's how you avoid influenza. It's how you you know avoid colds. It's certainly how you should take care of yourself with this outbreak. The bigger difference, I think, for what's going on right now versus the way we deal with you know yearly seasonal infections like influenza is that there still is a potential to to eradicate this in humans. Um, when SARS came up, when MERS came up the first time, when they broke out into humans. We were able to contain the virus in such a way that it disappeared from the human population and we don't therefore have it always around and we don't get it every year. We did, have not done that with a couple other coronaviruses that exist. So there are like four or five coronaviruses that exist in the human population that are endemic, meaning we don't ever get rid of them. They're always there. They cause colds. We don't really notice them or care about them. Influenza is another virus we didn't ever contain and it changes and so it's always around it comes back out yearly seasonally we have to deal with it our goal in the way that we're handling coronavirus from a population standpoint is to try to get rid of it like we did SARS and MERS which are also coronaviruses and not let it take hold in the population like seasonal influenza and the coronaviruses that still exist so when we talk about quarantining and when we talk about um, you know, trying to limit contact. And we, and we do that in ways that we're not necessarily doing, say, with influenza. Uh, it's because we still have a hope that there's a way we might eradicate this from the human population and not have to deal with it every year. The, 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 the bad outcome would be that this takes hold in such a way that it never, ever goes away. And if we don't find a vaccine for it, then we're going to be dealing with it every year. Like the flu. Yeah. Now, of course, we don't yet know even enough to know that it's the kind of thing. Is it the kind of thing you get once? And then never again, in which oh, case, okay. eventually, huh. you know, everyone will get it, but it will then you won't have to deal with it all the time. Or is it going right. to be like influenza where, you know, it changes itself every year in such a way that you could get it over and over and over again? You know, chicken pox, for instance, uh, varicella, we have a vaccine for it. But even before the vaccine, you really got it once um, and then you never had to deal with it again. Now, it's, it's bad enough that we'd like people never to get it. And of course, if they never get it, then they might not get shingles and, and recurrences. But but you only ever really got chicken pox once. Will will this coronavirus be like that or will it be like influenza? We, we just don't know. And so there are a variety of ways that this could play out. But certainly the best case scenario would be containment and eradication, in which case, like SARS, like MERS, it goes away and we don't really have to deal with it anymore. You have a piece of The New York Times telling people how to wash their hands. It's really good. Everybody should read it. I'm linking to it in the show notes. Uh, but, Great. Aaron, you also uh, suggest that social pressure can play a role here. You retweeted somebody that uh, said, if your coworker is sick and he looks like death, tell him and encourage him to go home. Yeah. The worst thing you need to do is praise him for his commitment to creating value for shareholders or whatever. How, 
How, how, you know, this is a, a hard thing well, this, to create yeah. a policy for. This is a social sure, idea. No, social it's so easy to. First of all, like, we just do stuff wrong. I mean, this happens from an early age. I'm, I hate attendance awards at school. The idea that, like, you should be rewarded for never, ever, ever skipping school, no matter what the circumstances, is ridiculous. If you're uh. sick, we want kids to stay home. We don't want them to be incentivized in any way to try to go to school when they shouldn't be going to school. Like, I don't, I don't get that. But, but we do that the same thing at work. We make it very difficult for people to take time off and still get paid. You know, if they're minimum wage jobs or they're not going to get paid if they're not there, if they don't have paid time off, they're going to show. And of course, showing when you're sick is the absolute worst way to take care of, uh, you know, an infection like this in the community. Further, um, we don't, we don't really, yeah, I mean, that's just it. We just, we just have a society that, that values people who quote unquote suck it up, who show up to work even when they're sick, who power through it. We somehow think that that's stronger. That's bad. We want people to stay home when they're sick. We want to make it as easy as possible for them not to have to come, whether that's with policies that allow people to work from home when they're ill or get paid time off. You know, we're one of the few countries that doesn't manage to do that. It's ridiculous. So the other big point, there's a lot of points that you've been making, and and I want to get you to make here on the show uh, that once tests become available, people with symptoms may not want to get tested because they fear the medical bills. And this yeah. is part of the, the, the problem with our broken system where millions of people are uninsured or underinsured. I think one suggestion that you make is for the states that are still preventing the Medicaid expansion that's paid for by the federal government that the Affordable Care Act created. They should allow that, right? I mean, that's one idea. What else about this problem? Well, I mean, problem there's so people- many things. I'm, yeah, I mean, even getting back to, to, to testing and fear before we even get to insurance, you got to know that if you test positive, they're going to quarantine you for like two weeks. There are a lot of people who are so afraid of, you know, who will take care of my child, who will, uh, and what will they do at my job, that they're, they're going to avoid testing just because of that. So our broader policies in general are going to keep people from doing it. But of course, we make it incredibly expensive for people to get care. It's, it's actually my upcoming New York Times column is going to be on cost sharing. But, you know, we have deductibles stupidly in the United States kick in and restart every January, which means that deductibles are highest for people at the beginning of the year when, of course, we're peaking flu season and we peak now coronavirus. So it's like the fact that almost everyone has a massive deductible right now or some deductible that they're going to have to pay even if they try to get care is going to make people avoid care because that's what out-of-pocket cost sharing does. That's bad. Even then, people are worried about what will it cost or surprise billing if they go to an emergency room and they see a physician and we don't have protections. And there have been stories already in the New York Times, uh, I think Sarah Cliff has written about some, where people have gone to the emergency room because they feared and they were told to do so and then hit with surprise bills of thousands of dollars that their insurance is refusing to cover because like they saw an out-of-network physician who happened to be working in an in-network hospital. That's ridiculous. We have a system which drives people away from getting the care that they've needed. And, you know, to, to, to their credit, I mean, Governor Cuomo in New York State put out, and I freaked out about this yesterday on, on Twitter as well, but he, he put out a statement saying like, hey, insurance should cover uh, coronavirus testing you know, deductible free, out of pocket free. It should just be totally free. And that's great. Yeah. I'm fine with that, but let's be, and I think it's a good idea, but you know, the reality is, first of all, he's, he can really only make changes to Medicaid where out-of-pocket payments were already as small as they could possibly be. So it's a minor change. Secondly, it still doesn't remove the other cost barriers. Like how do they get to testing? How how are we going to cover transportation for people who are at the lowest end of the socioeconomic spectrum? What about missing work to do? So all the things I've already mentioned, all of that comes into play. That's not fixed. Plus, he can only really do it for Medicaid, which means that anyone who gets insurance through their jobs, which is the vast, you know, which is the majority of people that that's regulated by federal law. So he can't make insurance change that Medicare covering the people at highest risk is, of course, also, you know, regulated at the federal level. His, his, you know, policies will do nothing to affect the elderly in New York State who will still potentially face out-of-pocket payments. And so still the vast majority of people and the people at highest risk are not affected by these kinds of good faith efforts. So, yeah, they're necessary, but nowhere near sufficient. And our healthcare system is just massively broken to begin with. And when you see something like coronavirus come around, it just highlights 
in general how how bad it is and how difficult it is to fix things, even when it's potentially an emergency. You mentioned on Twitter that you own the domain name Best in the World My Ass. <laughs> Dot dot com, com, which I, do. I actually clicked and went to. Yeah, it's, it's pretty boring. I wonder how traffic it got since you... No, it gets so, no traffic. I don't even record it, yeah. Well, wh- why, when, and, when did you create that domain name and why? I used to write blog posts all the time that were called Best in the World My Ass um, because I'm, I'm offended by how politicians and Americans have this knee-jerk exceptionalism, this need to say that the United States healthcare system is the best in the world. I mean, it was even in Governor, Governor Cuomo's statement, and that I also railed that on Twitter. It, it, you know, in trying to pass this policy, he starts with like, of course we have the best healthcare system in the world. And it's like, shut up! If we had the best healthcare system in the world, you wouldn't need to make these changes. It's ridiculous. You're pointing out how right. broken it is, and that's why we need to do this. But you know, all the time you see politicians and other people who feel the need to reflexively say we have the best healthcare system in the world. And then I would go to the blog and write a post that was titled Best in the World, My Ass. Um, and then I shortened it into, I think, BIT, Best in the BITWMA. Um, but I, I just went out for the hell of it and bought Best in the World, My Ass dot com uh, years ago. And I, I keep meaning to go do something with it, but there's no time. But it's this reflexive exceptionalism that's ridiculous because on what metric, on by what measure do you think we have the best healthcare system in the world? And yet we feel the need to say it over and over and over again. And all of these countries who arguably have better systems than we do, they don't do that. It's a weird tick. Right. It's very American. Yeah, it is. Uh, well, when you look at the other healthcare systems, you just got back actually yeah. from both Switzerland and the Netherlands. Last year, you went to uh, several other countries. You've been studying other countries' healthcare systems for a long time. On this metric of handling a pandemic, I feel like I read something about South Korea has like a drive through testing kit. They've tested like thousands yep. of people, uh, whereas ours is completely broken and we have you know tested very few people and, yep, and don't and have I- the infrastructure and plans yep. to get it done. No, nope, but What's tests are broken. They don't work. I mean, they're, they're just they're just better organized and centralized. We've been cutting our budgets uh, to to deal with pandemics and to prepare in the last few years. We we just don't make progress. We're not organized. Like we don't. We have like fifty separate systems that don't necessarily work together and different silos in the federal government of who's in charge of what and tons of you know, potential vacancies or actual vacancies in our leadership infrastructure that have still not been filled. We don't fund this stuff adequately. We don't prepare. Our public health infrastructure is is tattered and severely undernourished. And all of that contributes to major problems. And we have a healthcare system in general, which which forces people to pay a lot of money to access care. We restrict care by cost. More Americans avoid necessary care because of cost. Uh, meaning they don't fulfill a prescription they've been given, um, they don't go to an appointment that, that's been made, or they don't get a test that's been ordered because of the cost, something like one in three Americans. Um, and that includes a ton of insured people as well. Um, even when you have insurance, more Americans avoid care because of cost than any other country we'd compare ourselves to in the world. And that also contributes to the problem. And all of that makes it difficult for us to respond to how, to how we might in, in, in a better way uh, when these kinds of emergencies arise. So what would you say to people who are living with panic and fear about themselves and their children that uh, this pandemic is the big one? Well, it's not. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's just not the, the big one in the sense that uh, that it's 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 we're not worried about this with an incredibly high fatality rate. Again, the, the, the fear from a broad public health standpoint is that this will become endemic and we will be dealing with this for years and years and years and years and years. And years. Um, it is not something that most people should fear, I think, you know, that they're going to get it and it's going to cause them to die. Of course, if you're in a high-risk group, immunocompromised or the elderly, that, that metric changes. But that metric changes, again, with lots of viruses that go around, including influenza every year. And remember, swine flu, when it really went around and was a pandemic a couple of years ago, had a, had a much higher mortality. We, we cared about that differently. Mortality rate was much higher um, and we were much, much more concerned than we are usually. But, but the way that you deal with this is the way that you should deal with 
you know, viral infections and serious viral infections all the time. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. I can't stress it enough. It's like rule one, two, and three. Um, wash your hands all the time after you use the bathroom, before you eat. Do not touch your face. The way that you bring this stuff is by touching it with your hands and then touching it to your face and getting it in your body. Don't do that. Yeah, a friend of mine uh, reaches in the back of his throat with his pinky. Oh my God. His, his throat. And Don't another do friend that. of mine picks his nose a lot. Or yeah, what would you tell that? that. Yeah, those two guys. Those two separate guys. Don't touch your face. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. When you cough, don't cough into your hands. Cough into your elbow because, of course, coughing in your hands makes your hands dirty. Then you got to wash your hands. Um, don't How touch. Do I stop touching my face. You got to just work to on it. I know everybody does, but you just got to seriously work on it. And if you catch yourself doing it, force yourself to wash your hands. Um, and that uh, maybe will help you do that. But, but you get that. That's how you do it. You know, if you can vaccinate when you can vaccinate, that's how you avoid, also avoid viral infections. What um, about masks? Do I get masks and gloves? Nope, nope, nope. Masks are, you know, the people who wear masks are most of the time are infected themselves or trying not to infect you. That's when masks come into play. When a surgeon operates and he wears a mask, it's to keep the sterile field going from him. It's not primarily to protect him from an infected patient. It's to protect the sterile field from the physician. Um, when doctors are often wearing masks, it's the same kind of thing or because they're seeing lots of patients and they don't want to infect large groups. So the, the, the rules are different for people in healthcare facilities or who are seeing and taking care of many, many patients. Um, but for the general public, if you are healthy, a mask is not doing you much good and all the people who are buying up masks who are healthy are removing them from the pool where, where healthcare workers and other people might need them. So masks are not how when you're healthy, you protect yourself from other individuals. What does? Washing your hands, washing your hands, washing your hands. Don't touch your face. Stay away from sick people. Don't go near other people when you're sick. The that's how you protect yourself. Uh, the uh, the antibacterial uh, spray lotion, that's not as good as soap in 20 no, seconds. No, soap is better. First place. of all, back, again, remember antibacterial is bacteria. These are viruses. They're different. Um, but again, nothing is as good as hand washing. Hand washing with soap is the best. 20 seconds is what the CDC and most studies point themselves out. And the studies aren't great, but that's what it points to. Hand washing, hand washing, hand washing with soap. That's what you should be doing. Major, major. That's well, the, best, the best thing you can do. Uh, when you look at the issue, a lot of people are focused on and critical of the federal government, the Trump administration, the people that he has appointed, your former governor. Mike Pence is in charge. Of course, he doesn't really believe in science. Once helped spread a disease, HIV. In Indiana with a dumb policy, he thinks uh, I think the moon is made of cheese and won't allow himself to be in a room <laughs> alone with a woman. But what about just local and state authorities, public health organizations? I mean, how much should we be worried that the federal government and the Trump administration is not prepared potentially uh, versus states and local uh, public health organizations? I mean, I think everyone's worried that we're not adequately responding to the task. I mean, th there aren't enough tests. And I think when, when more and more and more tests are going to come, become available, we're going to find that more and more people were infected than we thought. Because a lot of the illness may be mild. People don't even know they're infected. And so the panic is going to probably start when they start doing widespread testing and realize this thing is, is much broader than they thought. But that's not a reason to panic. Because again, take the precautions now Assuming it is more widespread. Wash, I mean, I, I know I'm being a broken record. Wash your hands. Don't go around sick people. Don't go out if you're sick. Cough into your elbow. This is what we should be doing now. It's what we should be doing when it is more widespread. It is what we should always be doing to protect ourselves from viruses every year, including influenza, which kills tens of thousands of people each year in the United States. It's a big deal. And I know I'm a broken record on your show about that as well. But we should always be doing those things. Do them now. Do them after coronavirus is gone, if it is. Do them if it becomes more widespread. It doesn't matter. That's what you should be doing. That's how you protect yourself. I appreciate your time. As always, we'll have to talk about uh, politics and healthcare proposals uh, next time, but yep. I really uh, appreciate it. Should we wash our hands? All the time. Go wash them right now. Okay. All right. I'm gonna, <laughs> I feel dirty. I always do. I work from home, so that's a problem. Or no, it's great because I'm not around people all day, I suppose. Yeah, but, there you go. Uh, thank you, Aaron Carroll. I appreciate it as always, my friend. Anytime. All right. Thank you very much, Aaron Carroll. Follow him right now on Twitter at Aaron E. Carroll. Tell him that you heard him on the podcast. Watch his YouTube channel, Healthcare Triage. Get his books, Bad Food Bible is the most recent one, and read him in the New York Times. All right. Moving on. Now we have to talk about the economic impact 
of a pandemic in the United States of America. What should you do with your money? Great questions for my next guest. It's Barry Ritholtz of the Big Picture blog, Ritholtz Wealth Management. He wrote Bailout Nation. Really smart guy. And I'm very happy to have him back on the show. Two of your favorites here, Dr. Aaron Carroll and Barry Ritholtz in one episode. Follow him on Twitter at Ritholtz. And here he is right now. Let's do it. All right, we've got him. Let's do it. We've got him. It is at Ritholtz, Barry Ritholtz. I've just given you a really very, very flattering introduction, and I appreciate you joining me. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Any time for you, Pete. Okay, so first of all, uh, Jack Welch died this week, and I wanted to start by talking about him because you had written a lot about Jack Welch on your blog including how he didn't trust the Bureau of Labor Statistics unemployment numbers and a whole bunch of economic reporters are sharing that and linking that. What was your obsession with the with Jack Welch and why do you want to be disrespectful about him uh, post life? Well, well, first, let's be fair. All those things took place before he died. I, I try not to speak ill of the dead. However, Jack Welch is an important person in the history of uh corporate America, and I think of him as a wildly overrated CEO. Now, the best thing about him is how incredibly lucky he was. He started in 1982, right at the beginning of the longest bull market in history, and pretty much tapped out in 2000, right before everything hit the fan. So (laughs) a lot of what everybody thinks is his genius is really just incredibly fortunate timing. That's one thing. The other thing is Jack Welsh notoriously cooked the books at General Electric. There's no other way to phrase it. The SEC find them. The, everybody who's looked at this, including government uh, investigators, have all come to the conclusion that General Electric smoothed its earnings out, which is really a very uh, nice euphemism for saying he used the complex... Um, opaque workings of GE Capital to occasionally pull some profits out and move it into the regular um, industrial side to make it look like they were a smooth, you know, money machine. After he left, Mm. all of a sudden the profits are up and down and all over the place. Why? Because that's what happens in real life. Profits aren't consistent. You cannot guarantee the same sort of returns year after year after year. Bernie Madoff taught us that. We know his entire, you know, decades-long run was nonsense. And after Welsh left, we discovered that he was full of crap. So of all the people in the world to come out and not only make an ignorant statement about how the Bureau of Labor Statistics assembles the data, but to accuse the Obama administration of cooking the books, uh, that was a bridge too far, and I went a little postal. And the best way to to attack somebody isn't to just say, this guy is a jerk, he divorced his wife, he married his students, all of which happen to be true, but to point out, hey, the reason you think this guy is great turns out to be nonsense. Oh, P.S., he's also a criminal. Yeah, well, you did a good job in those posts and uh, a lot of people talking about Jack Welch who passed away this week, but uh, a lot of people remembering him for the hijinks for cooking the books for the conspiracies and for the lack of empathy. I think it's fair to say about, you know, working class and middle class people too. Neutron Jack like to like to fire 10% of the staff every year kind of makes everybody else work harder and and be on edge. Not, not an especially sweetheart of a guy. All right. I wanted to ask you about the, a virus, the pandemic's effect on the economy and commerce in general, but specifically let's start with the fact that this week, the the Federal Reserve, uh, they cut interest rates a half point, which I think is huge. And I don't think anybody was expecting it. And there seems to be some pressure coming from the president, who's a conspiracy theorist and an idiot uh, on the chairman of the Fed. But your tweet kind of says it all, too. When you uh, tweeted at Ritholtz earlier this week, shouldn't a slowdown caused by a panic over a virus require more of a fiscal than monetary response. Are people canceling conferences and not going to Disneyland because interest rates are too high? Explain 
what the hell happened and why. So, so by the way, the, the same, you could say really the same thing that the financial crisis of 08 09 should have had, in addition to a modest monetary um, set of circumstances, should have also had a significant fiscal response because that's really an important aspect to this. Uh, look, right, I have a conference next week in California. Um, it's canceled because people are afraid to travel and uh, everybody is paranoid that they're going to pick up the coronavirus, um, which is definitely uh, a potentially dangerous um, virus that may end up going around the whole world. It doesn't help that our entire um, government response to it has been pretty inept and incompetent. Um, a friend of mine, uh, oh, you might know him, Morgan Housel, we were talking about all the conferences that are canceled. Um, mm. He mentioned a conference in Canada that was canceled, and the, the people producing the conference specifically cited the inept, hapless response of the U.S. government to the potential infection for, as part of the reason for canceling it. So the World Health Organization, and, and you don't need me to preface my remarks by saying I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a doctor, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about with this. However, I can assess how people are reacting in terms of economics and in terms of sentiment. That is something I have some knowledge and experience with. It looked to me like the, the Fed is panicking, 50 basis points, cutting it in half, uh, cutting half a base uh, percent. Seems like a wild overreaction. Nobody is not doing things because interest rates are so high. Interest rates, by any historical measure, are still very, very low. They're extremely accommodative. Mortgage rates are pretty much as, as low as, as we've seen in, a li in my lifetime. If you haven't refinanced your mortgage, well, go get a quote and, and see how much you can save each month. That's definitely a giant issue. But it's not like people aren't planning vacations or aren't buying well, houses or anything because rates are too high. Companies are not investing because of the uncertainty around the trade war. And companies are, are not making plans for travel because nobody knows where this is going to strike next. And it clearly is a potentially fatal disease, even though the numbers we've seen are 2%. 2% is a giant fatality rate. Um, the, the best news I've seen about this is it doesn't really seem to be affecting children. When you go back to the, the flu uh, pandemic of 1918, where 40 million people worldwide died, a lot of those yeah. people were kids. And yep. elderly, uh, the, the most interesting theory I've seen, and I have no idea if this is true, is that when you look at the people who died in China, a lot of them are, are males, especially older males. China has an extremely high uh, smoking rate. The United States, hmm. we have a much lower smoking rate, and this seems to attack the lungs and ultimately leading to pneumonia. And if you're a, a longstanding smoker, theorized one person, um, Maybe that is a factor. I don't know. I don't want to spread information well, that is factually inaccurate. It just seems like an intriguing thesis. But still, if it's not 2%, if it's 1%, hey, a 1% fatality rate when tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people could get infected is still a, a, a serious uh, serious uh, illness. The, right. the well, flu in the United States kills well, about thirty to 40,000 people. Well, annually. Well, we, we really don't know the numbers yet because we don't know how many people have contracted it, right. much less how many people have died. So it's really hard to, to look at that. But let's just get back to the financial point here, which is why why does the Fed do this? What did they what was the stated reason? Was just was this done just to juice the market for investors? And if so, did it work? So let's see. Last week, the market sold off uh, over 10 percent. That's the worst week we've seen since 2008. Um, if I was an active trader, I was on vacation and I was sitting on the beach and I said to my wife, I would be a giant buyer into this close because the market is just so stretched. You're going to just have a bounce back on Monday. And what happens beyond that is anyone's guess. And so this is in hindsight bias. The, when the rubber band gets stretched too far in one direction, it snaps back in the other direction. In response to the Fed rate cut, the market sold off pretty hard 
Uh, and I think the reason for that was, hey, the Fed is, seems to be panicking. What do they know that we don't know? And today, mm. we're recording this on a Wednesday. Today, the market's up about 3 4%, and it undid all of yesterday's sell-off. So we're still down pretty significantly from, from where we were two weeks ago. Um, but all things considered, it, it looks like the market is beginning to stabilize. And uh, we're going to be very dependent on news about this virus. Are, are, how many more cases are coming out? What do the numbers look like? What do the fatality rates look like? How widespread is this getting geographically? Is the government effective in stopping this? Or is this just like the wildfires in California out of control? So when people mm. tell you, well, I think this is the worst of it is behind us, uh, you're guessing that you know the answers to those questions. And I don't know the answer to those questions. So I can't tell you what's going to happen either with the economy or the market. It really depends on if this pandemic, and it's looking like a potential pandemic, brings gl the global economy down to 0% growth or even some form of a contraction, um, you, you would expect to see more market turmoil. By the way, for all we know, the worst of it's behind us and it's all um, you know, sunshine and, and flowers going forward. We just don't know. How, are, how, how is business worldwide, global commerce, dealing with it? Where, you know, it's just, I just think it's interesting to talk about the industries uh, that are in uh, different industries and how they're dealing with it. I mean, I've seen pictures of empty ports with no shipping containers in L.A. I've seen uh, stories about how much money the airline industry stands to lose. Obviously, travel and tourism. You look at a country like Italy that's been hit really hard. People aren't going there. What are some of the observations that you may that you're watching and looking at, which ones are the ones that make the kind of the most ripple effect on the global economy or the United States economy? So so there's two real ways to, to look at this. One is direct. And where are the deals right now, Red Holtz, huh? Yeah. The, one is direct and one is indirect. The uh, the direct way is obviously hotels, airlines, travel, Disneyland, things like that are, are really going to see some downtick un until it looks like the worst of this is behind us and and that's no surprise that has those are all pretty decent sized industries and that's going to have an impact on the national economy the global economy the more second tier um, indirect responses is the global supply chain all right so if if you want to go buy a new iPhone for example hey that's manufactured in China and elsewhere and even if you're not buying an iPhone, if you're buying something else that has components in different countries that may or may not source their components from China, right. you're, you're going to run into a potential issue. So Apple was, I use the iPhone as an example because Tim Cook of Apple, or Tim Apple, as he's known around the White House, um, had specifically come out and said, we see not only a decrease in demand uh, in China, but we see potential supply chain issues. And we can't tell you how this is going to affect our revenues, but we expect it will be not insignificant. And, you know, it's not that we've done anything wrong. Um, we're still executing on our business plan, but we are a global company with a global supply chain, and that supply chain is being disrupted. We're trying to create alternative sources, but that doesn't happen overnight. That takes months or years. The other thing that's so fascinating is watching companies plan for this, and it's really kind of interesting. And I'll give you two examples. One is J.P. Morgan and the other is Bloomberg. J.P. Morgan hmm. just did a mock everybody work from home today where they took 10% of their workforce and said, we're going to assume the pandemic has gotten much worse and you have to work from home. Go set it up and make sure you can do everything as if you're in the office. And so that sort of planning is pretty smart. Um, Bloomberg, where I write a column and, and do a radio show I was reading about, and what they did is they took each of their divisions and broke them in half. And so if you're in the news division, instead of everybody being in one building, so if anybody gets sick, everybody gets sick, they've broken the staff in half and they've moved people to secondary locations so that hmm. if there is a viral infection... 
um, it's less likely to take out an entire department. And they've done it with they've done it with news and radio and television and software and sales and HR and that they're very savvy with that sort of management stuff. Both of those uh, are are really I mean interesting, but most companies probably can't you know just get, get another building, get another space, and obviously. The downward effect as you move down the uh, the income scale here, when people have, uh, when they don't have, uh, you know, sick sick pay, sick leave, right. paid leave is what I'm looking for, and they don't have health insurance or they're underinsured, that really has a ripple effect, uh, a, a much stronger one on folks towards uh, the middle and bottom, right? Well, let me, I, I, I don't want to panic people, I don't want to scare people, but let me share with you my biggest concern is that people who are either uninsured or only have one of these terrible catastrophic insurance policies that the Trump administration pushed that doesn't cover regular medical visits and only covers, oh, you had a $100,000 surgery? Great, we'll cover half of it. Um, People who lack adequate health insurance, when they start to get sniffles, when they start to show symptoms, when they start to feel bad, are are they going to go to a doctor and get tested in order to stop this in its tracks, or are they just going to go home and take some, you know, DayQuil and, and ride it out? Not having a sufficient health care coverage for everybody in the country, it, it's sort of like the anti-vaxxers who don't vaccinate their kids and they put everybody else in second grade at risk because one or two kids potentially have the measles. Um, the people who lack the money and the insurance and the health care to be preventative or really proactive and responsive to this, that is not how you prevent a pandemic from uh, spreading. In fact, if I was looking for a country that I would think is more likely to see a greater spread than others, it's one that lacks basic health care and insurance um, for, for the middle class and lower class. How are you going to stop the spread if people are afraid to go to the doctor or unwilling right. to go to a hospital because they know they're going to get a ridiculous uh, bill? What is your what is your advice been uh, to your clients during this turbulent time? Do you have a uh, a pandemic advice plan at Ritholtz Wealth? Well, we have post nine eleven, uh, all of finance was required to set up an an emergency situation so that. Um, if we had to work virtually, if nobody could come into the office, it wouldn't affect us at all. We're, we're built not only to be virtual, but we're built with, um, we're all cloud-based and everything is, is set up so that if there was some emergency where none of us could get into the city, it wouldn't affect any aspect of what we do. That, that's part one. Part two, and, and by the way, kudos to the um, SEC and and the federal government for making sure that the industry had the capability of responding to another 9-11 type thing in order to not have the markets shut down, which basically really scared people amongst other things post 9-11. But the more normal business could continue, the less likely you're going to get a panic reaction, a fear reaction. So that's number one. And number two, we tell our clients all the time, and and you've heard this from me countless times, you are making investments for 20, 30, 40 years in the future. What happened on a given Tuesday is not relevant to you. And even if it's another 0809, with perfect hindsight, I could tell you, don't sell anything in 0809. Just write it out, and you'll be much better off a decade from now. Nobody wants to hear that, but time and again, 2000, you know, the 99.2000.com collapse, the 87 crash, the 73, 74, 0809. Go, go through the list. You're always better off looking forward a decade or two. It's painful. It's not easy to do. Nobody likes to do that, but it's one of those things that, you know, nobody looks back on their retirement and says, I'm glad I traded around the 1987 crash because people are not good at that. There's a tendency to panic out and not get back in. And, 
you know, when the market recovers, you're missing it. Uh, before I let you go, obviously talking mostly about finance, which is where your expertise lies, you had a really good post at uh, Ritholtz.com, the big picture, uh, which is political in nature. Radical moderates, I think everybody should read it. You, you start it by saying, I hesitate to write often about politics, given my bona fides on the topic are precisely zero. But you go on to make a bunch of really good points. And I just wanted to uh, say that I, I, I think there's some really good points. And yeah, I think the, the most important one is you say that, you know, seven months away is when the election is, yeah. uh, you know, and this horse race conversation that everybody's having right now is really not as important as it will be. But, you know, people are voting right now for who they think is the best person to beat Donald Trump. So what are some of your thoughts here? So a couple of things. First, you know, I was on vacation the week the market had its uh, little hiccup, its little down 12 percent, which is a lot in a given week. And I got to experience the market the way investors and clients do, which is they're getting dressed to go out in the morning. They flip on the TV. Here's some incendiary, inflammatory nonsense. And then I go out and enjoy my day on the beach thinking, what the fuck was that nonsense I just heard on television? And uh, I don't normally do that. I kind of ignore that side of um, the, the financial world. And so what, what ended up happening um, was I got home from vacation, and not only are we watching the South Carolina news on Saturday, but we're watching the whole Super Tuesday news yesterday. And lo and behold, it's the exact same feeling of why am I listening to people spout nonsense that they clearly don't know what they're talking about or, even worse, are unaware that they don't know what they're talking about. And so right. I, I like to put on my <laughs> cross, uh, my attorney's hat, as trial lawyer's hat, cross-examining, and I just imagine every time I watch something on television, if this was in court, would the judge allow it? Speculative, lacks a foundation as an expert, hearsay, um, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff that is not allowed in court because it's been demonstrated this is just inflammatory and doesn't lead to <laughs> yeah. facts. So I, right. I, I watch financial television on vacation the same way, and I, I watched these people spout nonsense that's un, unverified and either unproven or unprovable. And it's really frustrating. I'm just, I'm just shocked. Well, they have to fill up time. Honestly, it's about. It really is about. I mean, the same for the financial media. Yes. It's it's about filling time, getting ratings, and selling ads. It's it, it, it's. But I there's mean, that's the way. Am I being too cynical? Well, but there's a huge difference between a half hour show that is researched and there's facts and there's you know that's a very different experience. You know, I'm thinking about a podcast by Planet Money um, where they're taking a topic and they're doing a deep research into it and they're teaching you, or Freakonomics for that matter, and they're teaching you about what um, they've learned in their research. That's different than five jackasses sitting around spitballing bullshit. And that's right. what it feels like to me. It's like, oh, so you're filling an hour and everybody here is just talking about whatever – that's, that's unbelievable. When I do television and radio, I always try and say, this is what I want to talk about. Here's the most recent fill-in-the-blank column, whatever. And I don't want to guess about stuff. I don't want to speculate. I don't want to just off the top entertain people because it's destructive to them both in terms of their wealth and in terms of their ability to form a coherent model of the world around them. I'm a big believer right. in information theory and that we really need to be careful that we believe in reality and things that are true and verifiable as opposed to <clears throat> all the biases that we normally run into every day. Allowing that to govern our decision making, very dangerous thing to do. And expensive. Well, I appreciate you sharing that expertise with me here on the podcast. You've got your own podcast, Masters in Business. Everybody should listen to. Follow him on Twitter at Ritholtz. Get his daily reads, which I absolutely love. I never miss it. That comes in your email box. Go subscribe. Go to Ritholtz.com, the big picture. What else? That's pretty much everything. There you go, pal. I appreciate you doing this, and I will uh, talk to you very soon. Always, Thank you. Always fun chatting with you, Pete. 
And that is all I've got for you today. Dr. Aaron Carroll, that is at Aaron E. Carroll, and Barry Ritholtz, that is at Ritholtz. Check out the Big Picture blog. Really happy to have those two guys joining me. Very smart guys. You don't have to agree with every single thing they say, but they are two of the smartest people I can find, and I'd love to hear what you don't agree with on them. With them on, I think is what I meant to say, or any of the other guests. Tell me who you want to hear and sign up with a paid subscription. That is what sustains this here show. Your paid subscription of 5 or 10 or 25 or 50, whatever you want to pay, you can pay at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Thank you to Triskeel Promo. Check out in the show links, Dustin Barnett's company. He is the big sponsor of today's show. Appreciate it, Dustin, and everybody else paying on Patreon. And stay calm. Keep your hands clean. Think positive thoughts. Push the negative thoughts out every time you're having them. Recognize those thoughts you're thinking and push them out and think of your family, the things that make you happy. That is how you get through the day when you're having a tough one. At least that's what's usually been working for me. And don't forget to exercise. Exercising is a really big deal, I think. If you don't do that, let me know. I'll get you motivated. All right, that's it. We're out of time. I will talk to you on episode 60.